Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 12th of March 2021. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party Research Director Robert Barwick. Welcome. Thanks, Elisa. <clears throat> and on today's show, hand over your 75 trillion. Take it. And outsourcing government is surrendering democracy. So firstly today, hand over your 75 trillion. Lisa, we've got a, got a bombshell report we're going to go through today that, that'll explain this headline yeah. and why it relates to Australia Post. But firstly, a reminder, uh, we of course have been asking our viewers to intervene in the ongoing Senate inquiry on Australia Post, um, demanding that it not be sold off. And you have until next Friday, the 19th of March, to do so. And by the time you're watching this, that would be less than a week. So make sure you get your submission in. Go to our website for details. Every submission from the public is incredibly valuable. Don't delay it. Write, it, write a submission, upload it, and mail it off in a letter. Well, someone just sent us a, an, a, um, a, a fake stamp she's made up to put on the outside of her letter along with the real stamp, hmm. which is, we'll put on the screen, a, Chris, a stamp commemorating Christine Holgate. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So we're going to send the message in every way we can. Now, <clears throat> what we want to situate, the, the there's a, of course, a push for privatisation has been for a while of Australia Post, but we want to situate it in a bigger global agenda where nations are basically being held up in effect to hand over their national assets to sell them off. Uh, and what we saw with Australia Post under Chairman Ahmed Fahua is that it had, Australia Post had been run into the ground. Um, there was diddling of the books that was going on, all to you know show the proof that it was not profitable and it had to be sold off. Uh, now, when Christine Holgate came in, of course, she interfered with that agenda by making it perform, making it profitable, and she did an excellent job of that. Um, so, in order to try to disrupt what she was doing, one of the interventions was that a new chairman, Lucio Di Bartolomeo, was brought in uh, and a report was prepared, prepared for him as incoming chairman by Boston Consulting Group, which laid out the perspective. Of course, we don't know the details exactly of what's in there because it's secret and they intend to keep it that way. However, um, all indications um, you know, conspire to show the fact that the intention was to privatise it. And we'll go through the details of that in a moment. Um, now, even though that report was prepared for Bartolomeo to, you know, show him the pathway to continue to the push for privatisation, he lied to Senate estimates on the 9th of November last year, saying he'd never seen the report, despite that it had been prepared for him. And he also lied earlier, saying that Christine Holgate had agreed to stand aside. Um, and of course, then the process to force her out took place. But before we go into detail of that, I want to show you this bigger agenda um, to push for privatisation globally. And we're referring here to a report written by Boston Consulting Group uh, and a number of its um, employees called the $75 trillion opportunity in public assets. And this was put together in 2018. And it basically stated that governments around the world are under enormous financial pressure, while the need for investment, particularly in infrastructure, is growing. And we and can help with that. <laughs> exactly. So it went on to propose a solution, however, hiding in plain sight. Central governments worldwide control roughly 75 trillion in assets, according to conservative estimates, a staggering sum equal to the combined GDP of all countries. But governments struggle to properly manage and monetize those assets. They have a lack of internal expertise. They view things too short term because it's tied to election cycles. And they insist that government leaders must take aggressive action to harness the value of those public assets under their control. Uh, and of course, they propose various uh, privatisations, or they say, you know, it doesn't necessarily doesn't have to be Doesn't always have to be privatisation. We can do it in this form, this form, this Private, form. But effectively, public partnerships, corporatisations, etc. Transfer wealth from the public sector, which, is, which we all own, into private investors. So this is the broader agenda and Australia Post might seem like a tiny little fragment of that $75 trillion market, but what happens on this issue, which this Senate inquiry coming up could blow up into a major proportion, um, can be a hallmark for so many other instances, not just here, but globally. Yeah, no, for sure. So 
Um, the first thing people need to know, because we'll get into the details now, and I want to play a video. The first thing people need to know is that this $75 trillion salivation by Boston Consulting Group, drooling as they're writing about this on their, on their computers, it's got six co-authors from Boston Consulting. Three of them are Australian. Now, Boston Consulting is the second biggest consulting firm in the world, right? Um, the fact that three of the authors of this report are Australian shows you the Australian orientation to this agenda, right? Especially this fact. We're now going to talk about this secret 2019 review of Australia Post by Boston Consulting that the government's hiding. One of the, the, the review was conducted by one of these authors, hmm. right? So he wrote this article in 2018 and a year later he's conducting this secret review of Australia Post and they're hiding it from the, from the public. So, and it's the hiding of this report um, that has made all this story blow up, right? Because in order to hide it, the chairman, Lucio, lied to Parliament. That's how committed they are to hiding the report. And I want to play the video of that, Elisa, because it's the 9th of November. Christine Holgate's been ambushed three weeks earlier, right, on the 22nd of October. This chairman has then lied repeatedly to force her out. He lied that she'd agreed to stand aside when she hadn't. He lied that she had resigned when she hadn't. She'd offered to resign, but he, on certain terms, he rejected those terms. And in rejecting those terms, he negated her offer, right? And then announced she'd resigned anyway, right? And that was on the 2nd of November. Then a week later, he's appearing before the Senate estimates and he's being asked questions to do with the scandal because it had just blown up. And one of the senators, Nita Green, who we're going to see quite a bit of because she's, she's a consistent questioner on these matters for the Labor Party, she asks him about the Boston Consulting Group report. Just watch that exchange. In November 2019, the Morrison government engaged the Boston Consulting Group uh, for $1.3 million to undertake a review uh, into Australia Post. Um, Chair, could you confirm the report which was initiated and prepared before COVID uh, actually recommended permanently cutting mail services and closing some post offices? Uh, Senator, we haven't seen the report. So that's unequivocal. For space reasons, we're just showing his in, in, initial response, which is a flat out, no, I haven't seen it. Um, and then there's more questioning that goes after that, but it's the same message, no, we haven't seen this thing. Now, watch four months earlier in the same Senate committee, the same Senator, Nita Green, asking the question of Christine Holgate, the CEO of Australia Post at the time. And you're going to listen to Christine's answer and then you're going to hear Nick McDonald, the General Counsel of Australia Post, intervene and confirm Christine's answer. Just watch this exchange. What date did the Boston Consulting Group initiate its review of the Australia Post? BCG over the years, Senator, has done many reviews on Australia Post. The more recent one, the most recent one, started in November with the announcement of our new chairman. November last year. That's correct. And has that been completed now? That review. I believe that review is now completed. And and. To to be very clear, Ms Holgate, have you seen, have, has Australia Post received a final copy of the report? I would have to take on notice whether Australia Post has, but Senator, I have seen several versions of it. Uh, we did receive a, a draft, uh, or what's labelled a final draft, uh, dated the 21st of February. So, so what you have there is the proof that he lied. Christine Holgate said, yeah, we've seen the report, and the, and the Chief General Counsel said, yep, and it's, re, it's re marked final draft. The, that same General Counsel, Elisa, was present on the 9th of November when Lucio Di Bartolomeo lied to the Senate, and he said nothing. He just stayed quiet. Yet on the 21st of December, six weeks later, he writes a letter to the committee clarifying the record, because by then, the licensed post office group knew that he had lied, and they made an issue about it with the minister, and the minister must have tipped off Australia Post and said, oh, you should probably clarify this. So he writes this letter saying, oh, just to clarify. And then he said this in the letter, an Australia Post witness, that's the term he used, an Australia Post witness said we hadn't seen the report. Well, here's actually what's happened. Why would he write a letter referring to the chairman of Australia Post 
as an Australia Post witness. Even that letter is evasive. Mm. They are so intent on hiding this, and we, this is what got our attention. We asked the question, once we saw it was a clear-cut lie and proved, what, why would they do this? And, that, and, and we'll go through the whole story in a minute, but that's, it came on the back of asking that question. Why would the lie, why would he lie? Well, that leads to the biggest story behind Australia Post. And I'll add to that because, you know, BCG obviously has form in privatisation. That's what they do. They're renowned for it. But Fahua had been, he worked at BCG. He went back to work for them after uh, leaving Australia Post. And furthermore, the AFR said he'd set the business up for a possible lucrative privatisation in 2017. So all the elements are adding up. But we'll take a quick break and we'll continue after this. Welcome back to the Citizens Report where we're discussing hand over your 75 trillion and Australia Post's portion of that. Now go through some of the details about the BCG history with Australia Post. Okay, so Ahmed Fahor is the key character that was that did the most to set Australia Post up for privatization as you referenced earlier. He's a he came from NAB to head up Australia Post as CEO in 2009, but he'd only been at NAB for five years. Before that, for 13 years, he was with Boston Consulting, right, and including as a director of Boston Consulting. And so his job as a Boston Consulting guy is to look for value opportunities, right? This is how they think. And one of the things you do with a privatisation, it's a, it's a fine line between making the, a public enterprise profitable for the private sector but also doing it in such a way that it's cheap when you sell it because then the profits for the, for the investors are even greater, right? So problem is Australia Post was profitable, it was making money. Yeah, there was this evolution where letters um, were, were, were increasingly or, or decreasingly sent. There, was, there were fewer and fewer letters being sent, but there was a corresponding increase in parcels from online shopping, right? So we were preparing to send, send emails instead of letters, but we're buying stuff online and sending parcels and so Australia Post was still making money. In 2014, he enlisted Boston Consulting, his old firm, to do a review of Australia Post then, a fir the first review. Um, and they, they said, oh, there's going to be massive losses in the next decade, right? That'll add up to $12 billion just for the letters, offset by the parcels, total losses for the organisation in a decade will be $6.6 billion. Panic stations, we've got to sell real estate, we've got to slash the workforce by 2,000 people, we've got to ch and, and change the service obligation, Elisa, which is the key part, because it, because it's a public um, or a government business enterprise, it has, an ob it has a service obligation, a legal one. It has to provide a service to the public, and that centres around its mail delivery. And that's what they wanted to get rid of, because that part makes it less palatable as a privatisation target. Because if you buy it, you still got to... Without mm. that service obligation being removed, you've still got to sustain it and that's going to cost you money, right? So they had this excuse, we've got to get rid of the service ob obligation and so they, they come up with ways to um, water it down, right? Um, that was the plan. The next year, this is 2014, the next year on cue, Australia Post makes its biggest ever loss. In fact, not only its biggest ever, its only ever loss, $350 million loss, the union said, hang on, you are, when you said diddling the books earlier, that's what they're talking about. He padded that loss out. He made it as big as he could, right? Way too much, include all these provisions for future stuff, etc. cetera, um, because then that became the excuse to roll out this agenda. And that's what he was doing. He sold massive, he did massive real estate sales to, to in the subsequent years to, to, to make it look like he was making a profit. They sold his Sydney's historic GPO. They sold the Melbourne Mail Centre in the CBD of Melbourne, etc. $497 million worth of sales. Um, but then he's, at the, at, at the time, Elisa, he was the highest paid public servant in Australia. And that's what brought him undone because there was a huge reaction to that. And he had to leave, right? Everyone acknowledged that, you know, he was on $5.6 million, he had to go. Um, uh, Pauline Hanson had a role in that. There was big fights with them at the time. Um, but even the Prime Minister said, yeah, no, that's too much. So then he was replaced by Christine Holgate. And Christine Holgate came in with a totally different view, right, of management, as you've, as, you, as you've talked about. She said, we've got to protect the services by growing the business to make money. And she did. 
right? She, 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 she brought the parcels and the letters back together. So it's all one business. And then she did this great banking deal with the bank that earned them $220 million over three years. And that's what made Australia Post really profitable and the licensed post offices viable. And it's while that's happening that they, they, the government's saying, well, this is not the direction we wanted for Australia Post. I mean, they haven't said that, but by their actions, they said, because they installed this new chairman in 29 in Lucio, went back to Boston Consulting and said, do a new report mm. to inform this guy, right? And the way it's phrased, further inform the CEO. That means put this girl back in her place, yep. right? And there was a huge stink in Parliament over this. That 8th of July testimony we showed earlier, that was the, the Labor Party trying to get a hold of not just this report, but to prove that this report was associated with the, the change in mail delivery that happened during the pandemic. Right, this is what the government wanted. And even in that testimony, Christine Hellgate said, I believe in growing the business to protect its services. I don't want to get, do not want to get rid of its services. Four months after that, she's out of there. Mm -hmm. right? And the chairman who was given this commission um, from the government and BCG is the one that dealt her the killer political blow. Yeah. So they got her out. They forced her out. But there's only one problem. <laughs> They would have expected her to go off with, yeah. with her tail between her legs. Yeah. And, you know, who wouldn't after this long and the, what she copped for it? She, there Most was a cartoon depicting her as a prostitute. Yeah. Right? But Things she, like that. But she didn't. And people say, why? Why would she want to return? Why would she want to take that job back after everything that's happened? Because she actually cares about Australia Post, the local post office groups, and she's determined to do what she set out to do, to make them profitable, to give them a future. And it's one example across the whole country. If we had more people like her, what could we actually be doing? And people in politics, people in government. Um, so the government were not expecting this. They expected it all to go, go away and blow over. But for her and for other people like the LPOs, like our political circles that are activating on this. Yeah. So make yeah, That's submission. right. We've made this blow up in their face. Uh, Elisa, the details are contained in this week's issue of the Australian Alert Service, mm -hmm. right? We, we can't do justice to it in this conversation. Get a copy of that. It's also on our website. It's called Getting in the Way, How Christine Holgate Upset a $75 trillion privatisation agenda. Read the details of that and then take pleasure in the fact that we have blown this up in their face. Now, we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back to discuss another aspect of this privatisation plan globally. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. We're now discussing outsourcing government is surrendering democracy. Now, there's been a push globally for some time now and since the global financial crisis and it's intensified in recent years to not only privatise but um, there's been a real um, glorification of the process of PPPs, public-private partnerships. Um, as a in-between means of privatising assets um, because privatisation itself has become such a dirty word. And um, one example I wanted to mention which sort of situates how nations that are forced to privatise everything are also forced to hand over their sovereignty to banks and big companies on a silver platter uh, is Italy because um, the new Prime Minister, as people may know, Mario Draghi, former head of the European Central Bank uh, and former Goldman Sachs banker and um, uh, he was also at the Financial Stability Board that invented bail-in, yep. he actually played a key role in forcing Italy into the European Union by a wholesale mass privatisation of Italy's national assets, which was organised in 1992 when he met with the Queen of England and City of London bankers on the Royal Yacht Britannia off the coast of Italy. Now, the EU, of course, is supranational government, and this is kind of like a model for what the entire world is expected to do, is to hand over their national sovereignty, hand over their assets. So this is part and sovereignty of the... is democracy, Elisa. You can't. You, you, there's no democracy involved in these big mm. supranational governments. Right? And if you put democracy is local. You put everything, all your assets, in private hands. There's no accountability. Now, I yeah. wanted to raise two issues as examples in Australia, and these are covered in articles in our Australian Alert Service. To find out more, you can contact us. Firstly, is aged care, which is a story of privatisation, of outsourcing, and privately contracting care. Now, the final 
Aged Care Royal Commission report points to this and lays the blame at John Howard's 1997 Aged Care Act uh, with its um, devotion to austerity, saving money, things like efficiency, dividends and rationing of care. And they state in the introduction to the report that successive, successive governments viewed the aged care sector as a form of welfare for the very needy to be provided to the bare minimum extent required. And that our history of aged care is a history of the decisions about how much the Australian government is willing to spend on the care of older people. The Act, it says, is focused on restraining expenditure rather than on the rights of older people to get the care they need. Now, we've basically set up a situation like a Ponzi scheme in this country where interest-free refundable accommodation deposits can be uh, invested by the private operators. They're getting massive government grants, they're avoiding tax and therefore making profits four times higher than their overseas counterparts and 10% more than local public uh, counterparts. That's shocking. Uh, we spend half as much on age, aged care as other less populous nations overseas. Now, I want to show a clip of uh, National Seniors Australia Chief Advocate Ian Henschke talking about how we can solve this problem. It's right to the point. Look, anything can be achieved with political will. Now, let's think about it. At the moment, the people who are um, being trained as aged care workers, uh, you can get this with a, a six-week certificate course. So... I, we're saying that you need to have much more training uh, and, in fact, let's just say, for example, we rolled out some six-month training courses across Australia and you put an aged care training centre in each state and large country town across Australia and you put 100 people in there today and said, right, you're, you're going to be uh, screened and out of that we'll, we'll pick out the best uh, that, that suit it and we'll train you and we'll have you trained. So at the end of six months you could have 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 people depending on how you scaled it but you have to have a system. You can't just let the market sort it out. I mean the, the, the Commissioner Pagoni said this is not a market. You know it's not like uh, selling hamburgers or or any other market that's there. It's part of the health system. You have to train people. We did it in the 1970s with schools when there was a baby boom. You remember when the babies were coming through from the, from the baby boom and we built kindergartens. We trained kindergarten teachers. We trained teachers. We, we, we had them on bonded training programs. They spent some time in the classroom, some time in the school. We did the same thing with nurses. We had wings of nurses uh, living at hospitals, being trained. We did all that. Mm. So let's just accept the fact that it has to be fixed and you need to train it and government will have to have a play a role in it. Don't just leave it up to the to the private market. It's not one of those things where you just you turn the wheel and it says market forces will sort it out. Market mm. forces have got us to where we are today and that's why you've got to question everything about the system that exists today, rebuild it, throw away the Act, build some training centres and actually get it done. Now, this same issue has been raised in a very powerful intervention by the, what's called the National Resilience Project, coordinated by retired Air Vice Marshal John Blackburn, and it involves senior serving and retired public servants um, that are demanding the neoliberal reforms that got us to this point where we've handed over everything that should be done by the public sector to the KPMGs and BCGs of this world must be reversed. It's put us in a dangerous situation. We have the capabilities in the public service. It's no different to private. We need to restore those capabilities. Well, they've un that's right. They've undermined the capabilities in the public service, at least, and they expect BCG to be able to do everything from gutting Australia Post to running the contact tracing and testing system in, in Victoria. That's a public. These are public service jobs looking at, that should be looking after all that, not a private operator looking for profit opportunity. That's right. So make your submission. Thanks for joining us, and tune in again next week. Thanks. Mm -hmm.